this is Pija Feta's account from the Milan edition. Pija Feta's account of Magellan's voyage. The First Voyage Around the World by Antonio Pigafetta, translated by Lord Stanley of Alderley. Pigafetta's account of Magellan's voyage. Patrician of Vicenza and knight of Rhodes to the very illustrious and very excellent Lord Philip de Villiers Les Leyden, the famous Grand Master of Rhodes, his most respected lord. Since there are several curious persons, very illustrious and very reverend lord, who not only are pleased to listen to and learn the great and wonderful things which God has permitted me to see and suffer in the long and perilous navigation which I have performed, and which is written hereafter, but also they desire to learn the methods and fashions of the road which I have taken in order to go thither, and who do not grant firm belief to the end unless they are first well advised and assured of the commencement. Therefore, my lord, it will please you to hear that finding myself in Spain in the year of the nativity of our lord, 1519, at the court of the most serene king of the Romans, with the reverend Lord Mons, Francis Cheragato, then apostolic proto-notary, an ambassador of the Pope Leon X, who, through his virtue, afterwards arrived at the bishopric of Aprutino and the principality of Theramo, and knowing both by the reading of many books and by the report of many lettered and well-informed persons who conversed with the said proto-notary, the very great and awful things of the ocean. I deliberated, with the favor of the emperor and the above noted lord, to experiment and go and see with my eyes a part of those things, by which means I could satisfy the desire of the said lords and mine own also, so that it might be said that I had performed the said voyage and seen well with my eyes the things hereafter written. Now, in order to decipher the commencement of my voyage, very illustrious lord, having heard that there was in the city of Seville a small armada to the number of five ships, ready to perform this long voyage, that is to say, to find the islands of Maluco, from whence the spices come, of which Armad the Captain General was Fernando Magaglianis, a Portuguese gentleman, commander of St. James of the Sword, who had performed several voyages in the ocean sea, in which he had behaved very honorably as a good man. I set out with many others in my favor from Barcelona, where at the time the emperor was, and came by sea as far as Malaga. And thence I went away by land until I arrived at the said city of Seville. There I remained for the space of three months, waiting till the said armad was in order and readiness to perform its voyage. And because, very illustrious lord, that on the return from the said voyage, on going to Rome towards the holiness of our holy father, I found your lordship at Monterosa, where of your favor you gave me a good reception, and afterwards gave me to understand that you desired to have in writing the things which God of his grace had permitted me to see in my said voyage. Therefore to satisfy and accede to your desire. I have reduced into this small book the principal things in the best manner that I have been able. Finally, after all provisions had been made and the vessels were in order, the Captain General, a discreet and virtuous man, careful of his honor, would not commence his voyage without first making some good and wholesome ordinances, such as it is the good custom to make for those who go to sea. Nevertheless, he did not entirely declare the voyage which he was going to make, so that his men should not from amazement and fear be unwilling to accompany him on so long a voyage, as he had undertaken in his intention. Considering the great and impetuous storms which are on the ocean sea, where I wish to go, and for another reason also, that is to say that the masters and captains of the other ships of his company did not love him, of this I do not know the reason except by cause of his, the captain general, being Portuguese, and they were Spaniards or Castilians, who for a long time have been in rivalry and ill will with one another. Notwithstanding this, all were obedient to him. He made his ordinances such as those which follow, so that during the storms at sea, which often come on by night and day, his ships should not go away and separate from one another. These ordinances he published and made over in writing to each master of the ships, and commanded them to be observed and inviolably kept, unless there were great and legitimate excuses, an appearance of not having been able to do otherwise. Firstly, the said Captain General willed that the vessel in which he himself was should go before the other vessels, and that the others should follow it. Therefore he carried by night on the poop of his ship a torch or faggot of burning wood, which they called feral, which burned all the night, so that his ship should not lose sight of him. Sometimes he set a lantern, sometimes a thick cord of reeds was lighted, which was called trench. This is made of reeds well soaked in the water and much beaten. Then they are dried in the sun or in the smoke, and it is a thing very suitable for such a matter. When the captain had made one of his signals to his people, they answered in the same way. In that manner they knew whether the ships were following and keeping together or not. And when he wished to take attack on account of the change of weather, 
or if the wind was contrary, or if he wished to make less way, he had two lights shown, and if he wished the others to lower their small sail, which was a part of the sail attached to the great sail, he showed three lights. Also by the three lights, notwithstanding that the wind was fair for going faster, he signaled that the studding sail should be lowered, so that the great sail might be quicker and more easily struck and furled when bad weather should suddenly set in, on account of some squall or otherwise. Likewise, when the captain wished the other ships to lower the sail, he had four lights shown, which shortly after he had put out and then showed a single one, which was a signal that he wished to stop there and turn, so that the other ships might do as he did. Withal, when he discovered any land or shoal, that is to say a rock at sea, he made several lights be shown or had a bombard fired off. If he wished to sail, he signaled to the other ships with four lights, so that they should do as he did, and follow him. He always carried this said lantern suspended to the poop of his vessel. Also, when he wished the studding sail to be replaced with the great sail, he showed three lights, and to know whether all the ships followed him and were coming together, he showed one light only besides the ferrule, and then each of the ships showed another light, which was an answering signal. Besides the above-mentioned ordinances for carrying on seamanship as is fitting, and to avoid the dangers which may come upon those who do not keep watch, the said captain, who was expert in the things required for navigation, ordered that three watches should be kept at night. The first was at the beginning of the night, the second at midnight, and the third towards break of day, which is commonly called La Diane, otherwise the star of the break of day. Every night these watches were changed. That is to say, he who had kept the first watch on the following day kept the second, and he who had kept the second kept the third, and so on they changed continually every night. The said captain commanded that his regulations both for the signals and the watches should be well observed, so that their voyage should be made with greater security. The crews of this fleet were divided into three companies. The first belonged to the captain, the second to the pilot or nocier, and the third to the master. These regulations having been made, the captain general deliberated on sailing as follows. Monday, the day of St. Lawrence, the 10th of August, in the year above mentioned, the fleet provided with what was necessary for it, and carrying crews of different nations, to the number of 237 men and all the five ships, was ready to set sail from the Mole of Seville. And firing all the artillery, we made sail only on the foremast, and came to the end of a river named Betis, which is now called Guadalcavir. And going along this river, we passed by a place named Gion de Ferrax, where there was a large population of Moors, and there was a bridge over the river by which one went to Seville. This bridge was ruined, however, there had remained two columns which are at the bottom of the water, on which account it is necessary to have people of the country of experience and knowledge to point out the convenient spot for safely passing between these two columns, from fear of striking against them. Besides that, it is necessary in order to pass safely by this bridge and by other places on this river, that the water should be rather high. After having passed the two columns, we came to another place named Korea, and passing by many little villages lying along the said river, at last we arrived at a castle, which belongs to the Duke of Medina Sidonia, named St. Lucar, where there is a port from which to enter the ocean sea. It is entered by the east wind, and you go out by the west wind. Near there is the Cape of St. Vincent, which, according to cosmography, is in 37 degrees of latitude, at 20 miles distance from the said port. From the aforesaid town to this port by the river there are 35 or 40 miles. A few days afterwards the captain general came along the said river with his boat, and the masters of the other ships with him, and we remained some days in this port to supply the fleet with some necessary things. We went every day to hear mass on shore, at a church named Our Lady of Barameda, towards St. Lucar. There the captain commanded that all the men of the fleet should confess before going on any further, in which he himself showed the way to the others. Besides, he did not choose that anyone should bring any married woman or others to the ships for several good considerations. Tuesday, the 20th September of the said year, we set sail from St. Lucar, making the course of the southwest otherwise named La Beche. And on the 26th of the said month, we arrived at an island of Great Canaria named Tenerife, which is in 28 degrees latitude. There we remained three days and a half to take in provisions and other things which were wanted. After that we set sail thence and came to a port named Monterose, where we sojourned two days to supply ourselves with pitch, which is a thing necessary for ships. It is to be known that among the other isles which are at the said Great Canaria, there is one, where not a drop of water is to be found proceeding from a mountain or a river, 
Only once a day at the hour of midday there descends a cloud from the sky which envelops a large tree which is in this island, and it falls upon the leaves of the tree, and a great abundance of water distills from these leaves, so that at the foot of the tree there is so large a quantity of water that it seems as if there was an ever-running fountain. The men who inhabit this place are satisfied with this water. Also the animals, both domestic and wild, drink of it. Monday, the 3rd of October of the said year, at the hour of midnight, we set sail, making the course austere, which the Levantine mariners call Siroc, entering into the ocean sea. We passed the Cape Verde and the neighboring islands in fourteen and a half degrees, and we navigated for several days by the coast of Guinea or Ethiopia, where there is a mountain called Sierra Leona, which is in eight degrees latitude according to the art and science of cosmography and astrology. Sometimes we had the wind contrary and at other times sufficiently good, and rains without wind. In this manner we navigated with rain for the space of sixty days until the equinoctial line, which was a thing very strange and unaccustomed to be seen, according to the saying of some old men and those who had navigated here several times. Nevertheless, before reaching this equinoctial line, we had in fourteen degrees a variety of weather and bad winds, as much on account of squalls as for the head winds and currents, which came in such a manner that we could no longer advance. In order that our ships might not perish nor broach too, as it often happens when the squalls come together, we struck our sails, and in that manner we went about the sea hither and thither until the fair weather came. During the calm there came large fishes near the ships which they called tiburoni, sharks, which have teeth of a terrible kind, and eat people when they find them in the sea either alive or dead. These fishes are caught with a device which the mariners call hamk, which is a hook of iron. Of these some were caught by our men. However, they are worth nothing to eat when they are large, and even the small ones are worth but little. During the storms, the body of St. Anselm appeared to us several times, amongst others, one night that it was very dark, on account of the bad weather, the said saint appeared in the form of a fire lighted at the summit of the mainmast, and remained there near two hours and a half, which comforted us greatly, for we were in tears, only expecting the hour of perishing and when that holy light was going away from us, gave out so great a brilliancy in the eyes of each, that we were near a quarter of an hour like people blinded, and calling out for mercy. For without any doubt nobody hoped to escape from that storm. It is to be noted that all, and as many times as that light which represents the said Saint Anselm shows itself and descends upon a vessel which is in a storm at sea, that vessel never is lost. Immediately that this light had departed the sea grew calmer, and then we saw diverse sorts of birds, amongst others there were some which had no fundament. There is also another kind of bird of such a nature that when the female wishes to lay her eggs she goes and lays them on the back of the male, and there it is that the eggs are hatched. This last kind have no feet and are always in the sea. There is another kind of bird which only lives on the droppings of the other birds. This is a true thing, and they are named Cagaselo, for I have seen them follow the other birds until they had done what nature ordered them to do and after it has eat this dirty diet it does not follow any other bird until hunger returns to it. It always does the same thing. There are also fish which fly, and we saw a great quantity of them together, so many that it seemed that it was an island in the sea. After that we had passed the equinoctial line towards the south, we lost the star of the Tre Montana, and we navigated between the south and Garbin, which is the collateral wind or point between south and west and we crossed as far as a country named Verzen, which is in 24 degrees and a half of the Antarctic sky. This country is from the Cape St. Augustine, which is in 8 degrees in the Antarctic sky. At this place we had refreshments of victuals, like fowls and meat of calves. Also a variety of fruits, called batat, piña, or pineapples, sweet of singular goodness, and many other things which I have omitted mentioning not to be too long. The people of the said place gave, in order to have a knife or a hook for catching fish, five or six fowls, and for a comb they gave two geese, and for a small mirror or a pair of scissors they gave so much fish that ten men could have eaten of it, and for a bell or hawk's bell they gave a full basket of the fruit named batat. This has the taste of a chestnut and is the length of a shuttle. For a king of cards of that kind which they used to play with in Italy, they gave me five fowls and thought they had cheated me. We entered into this port the day of St. Lucy, 13th December, before Christmas, on which day we had the sun on the zenith, which is a term of astrology. This zenith is a point in the sky, according to astrologers, and only in imagination, and it answers to over our head in a straight line, as may be seen by the treaties of the sphere, and by Aristotle in the first book, De Cielo et Mondo. 
On the day that we had the sun in the zenith, we felt greater heat as much as when we were on the equinoctial line. The said country of Verzen is very abundant in all good things, and is larger than France, Spain, and Italy altogether. It is one of the countries which the king of Portugal has conquered or acquired. Its inhabitants are not Christians, and adore nothing but live according to the uses of nature, rather bestially than otherwise. Some of these people live a hundred or a hundred and twenty or a hundred and forty years and more. They go naked, both men and women. Their dwellings and houses that are rather long and which they call boy, they sleep upon cotton nets which they call in their language amash. These nets are fastened to large timbers from one end of their house to the other. They make the fire to warm themselves right under their bed. It is to be known that in each of these houses which they call boy, there dwells a family of a hundred persons who make a great noise. In this place they have boats which are made of a tree, all in one piece, which they call canoe. These are not made with iron instruments, for they have not got any, but with stones like pebbles, and with these they plane and dig out these boats. Into these thirty or forty men enter, and their oars are made like iron shovels. And those who row these oars are black people, quite naked and shaven. The men and women of this said place are well made in their bodies. They eat the flesh of their enemies, not as good meat, but because they have adopted this custom. Now this custom arose as follows. An old woman of this place of Virgin had an only son, who was killed by his enemies. And some days afterwards, the friends of this woman captured one of the said enemies, who had put her son to death, and brought him to where she was. Immediately the said old woman, seeing the man who was captured and recollecting the death of her child, rushed upon him like a mad dog and bit him on the shoulder. However, this man who had been taken prisoner found means to run away, and told how they had wished to eat him, showing the bite which the said old woman had made in his shoulder. After that, those who were caught on one side or other were eaten. Through that arose this custom in this place of eating the enemies of each other. But they do not eat up the whole body of the man whom they take prisoner. They eat him bit by bit and for fear that he should be spoiled, they cut him up into pieces, which they set to dry in the chimney. And every day they cut a small piece, and eat it with their ordinary victuals in memory of their enemies. I was assured that this custom was true by a pilot named John Carvaggio, who was in our company, and had remained four years in this place. It is also to be observed that the inhabitants of this place, both men and women, are accustomed to paint themselves with fire all over the body, and also the face. The men are shaven and wear no beard, because they pluck it out themselves. And for all clothing they wear a circle surrounded with the largest feathers of parrots, and they only cover their posterior parts, which is a cause of laughter and mockery. The people of this place, almost all, excepting women and children, have three holes in the lower lip, and carry, hanging in them, small round stones about a finger in length. These kind of people, both men and women, are not very black, but rather brown, and they openly show their shame and have no hair on the whole of their bodies. The king of this country is called Kasich, and there are here an infinite number of parrots, of which they give eight or ten for a looking glass. There are also some little cat monkeys, having almost the appearance of a lion. They are yellow and handsome and agreeable to look at. The people of this place make bread, which is of a round shape, and they take the marrow of certain trees which are there between the bark and the tree, but it is not at all good, and resembles fresh cheese. There are also some pigs which have their navel on the back, and large birds which have their beak like a spoon, and they have no tongue. For a hatchet or for a knife they used to give us one or two of their daughters as slaves, but their wives they would not give up for anything in the world. According to what they say, the women of this place never render duty to their husbands by day, but only at night. They attend to business out of doors and carry all that they require for their husbands' victuals inside small baskets on their heads or fastened to their heads. Their husbands go with them and carry a bow of virgin, or of black palm, with a handful of arrows of cane. They do this because they are very jealous of their wives. These carry their children fastened to their neck, and they are inside a thing made of cotton in the manner of a net. I omit relating many other strange things, not to be too prolix, however. I will not forget to say that Mass was said twice on shore, where there were many people of the said country who remained on their knees and their hands joined in great reverence during the Mass, so that it was a pleasure and a subject of compassion to see them. In a short time they built a house for us, as they imagined that we should remain a long time with them. And at our departure thence they gave us a large quantity of verzin. It is a color which proceeds from the trees which are in this country, and they are in such quantity that the country is called from it verzin. It is to be known that it happened that it had not rained for two months before we came there, and the day that we arrived it began to rain 
on which account the people of the said place said that we came from heaven, and had brought the rain with us, which was great simplicity, and these people were easily converted to the Christian faith. Besides the above-mentioned things, which were rather simple, the people of this country showed us another, very simple, for they imagined that the small ship's boats were the children of the ships, and that the said ships brought them forth when the boats were hoisted out to send the men hither and thither, and when the boats were alongside the ship, they thought that the ships were giving them suck. A beautiful young girl came one day inside the ship of our captain, where I was, and did not come except to seek for her luck. However, she directed her looks to the cabin of the master, and saw a nail of a finger's length, and went and took it as something valuable and new, and hid it in her hair. For otherwise she would not have been able to conceal it, because she was naked. And bending forward she went away, and the captain and I saw this mystery. Now here it shows some words of this people of Verzen. And you can see that Verzen here is sort of Brazil area, which is the cannibal people. Millet, omil, maize. Flower, farine, hui. A hook, ungheim, pinda. A knife, un couteau, tas, or tars. A comb, un peña, shignap, shipag. A fork, un forset, pirarn. A bell, un sonnet, item naraka, han maraka. Good, more than good, bon, plocubon, turn, maragatorn. We remained thirteen days in this country of Verzen and, departing from it and following our course, we went as far as thirty-four degrees, and a third towards the Antarctic Pole. There we found near a river men whom they call cannibals who eat human flesh, and one of these men, great as a giant, came to the captain's ship to ascertain, and ask if the others might come. This man had a voice like a bull, and whilst this man was at the ship his companions carried off all their goods which they had to a castle farther off, from fear of us. Seeing that, we landed a hundred men from the ships and went after them to try and catch some others. However, they gained in running away. This kind of people did more with one step than we could do at a bound. In the same river there were seven little islands, and in the largest of them precious stones are found. This place was formerly called the Cape of St. Mary, and it was thought there that from thence there was a passage to the Sea of Sir, that is to say the South Sea, and it is not found that any ship has ever discovered anything more, having passed beyond the said cape. And now it is no longer a cape, but it is a river which has a mouth seventeen leagues in width, by which it enters into the sea. In past time in this river, these great men named Cannibali ate a Spanish captain named John de Sola, and sixty men who had gone to discover land, as we were doing, and trusted too much to them. Afterwards, following the same course towards the Antarctic Pole, going along the land, we found two islands full of geese and goslings and sea wolves, of which geese the larger number could not be reckoned for we loaded all the five ships with them in an hour. These geese are black and have their feathers all over the body of the same size and shape, and they do not fly and live upon fish, and they were so fat that they did not pluck them but skinned them. They have beaks like that of a crow. The sea wolves of these two islands are of many colors and of the size and thickness of a calf, and have a head like that of a calf and the ears small and round. They have large teeth and have no leg, but feet joining close on to the body, which resemble a human hand. They have small nails to their feet, and skin between the fingers like geese. If these animals could run, they would be very bad and cruel, but they do not stir from the water, and swim and live upon fish. In this place we endured a great storm, and thought we should have been lost. But the three holy bodies, that is to say, St. Anselmo, St. Nicholas, and St. Clara, appeared to us, and immediately the storm ceased. Departing thence as far as forty-nine degrees and a half in the Antarctic heavens, as we were in the winter, we entered into a port to pass the winter, and remained there two whole months without ever seeing anybody. However, one day, without anyone expecting it, we saw a giant, who was on the shore of the sea, quite naked, and was dancing and leaping and singing, and while singing he put the sand and dust on his head. Our captain sent one of his men towards him, to assure him, whom he charged to sing and leap like the other to reassure him and show him friendship. This he did, and immediately the sailor led this giant to a little island where the captain was waiting for him. And when he was before us, he began to be astonished and to be afraid, and he raised one finger on high, thinking that we came from heaven. He was so tall that the tallest of us only came up to his waist. However, he was well built. He had a large face painted red all round, and his eyes also were painted yellow around them, and he had two hearts painted on his cheeks. He had but little hair on his head, and it was painted white. 
When he was brought before the captain, he was clothed with the skin of a certain beast, which skin was very skillfully sewed. This beast had its head and its ears the size of a mule, and the neck and body of the fashion of a camel, the legs of a deer, and the tail like that of a horse, and it neighs like a horse. There is a great quantity of these animals in this same place. This giant had his feet covered with the skin of this animal in the form of shoes, and he carried in his hand a short and thick bow, with a thick cord made of the gut of the said beast, with a bundle of cane arrows, which were not very long and were feathered like ours, but they had no iron at the end, though they had at the end some small white and black cut stones, and these arrows were like those which the Turks use. The captain caused food and drink to be given to this giant, then they showed him some things, amongst others a steel mirror. When the giant saw his likeness in it, he was greatly terrified, leaping backwards, and made three or four of our men fall down. After that, the captain gave him two bells, a mirror, a comb, and a chaplet of beads, and sent him back on shore, having him accompanied by four armed men. One of the companions of this giant, who had never come to this ship, on seeing the other coming back with our people, came forward and ran to where the other giants dwelled. These came one after the other all naked, and began to leap and sing, raising one finger to heaven, and showing to our people a certain white powder made of the roots of herbs, which they kept in earthen pots, and they made signs that they lived on that, and that they had nothing else to eat than this powder. Therefore our people made them signs to come to the ship, and that they would help them to carry their bundles. Then these men came, who carried only their bows in their hands, but their wives came after them laden like donkeys, and carried their goods. These women are not as tall as the men, but they are very sufficiently large. When we saw them, we were all amazed and astonished, for they had the breasts half an ell long, and had their faces painted, and were dressed like the men. But they wore a small skin before them to cover themselves. They brought with them four of those little beasts of which they make their clothing, and they led them with a cord in the manner of dogs coupled together. When these people wished to catch these animals, with which they clothed themselves, they fasten one of the young ones to a bush, and afterwards the large ones come to play with the little one, and the giants are hid behind some hedge, and by shooting their arrows they kill the large ones. Our men brought eighteen of these giants, both men and women, whom they placed in two divisions, half on one side of the port and the other half at the other, to hunt the said animals. Six days after, our people on going to cut wood saw another giant, with his face painted and clothed like the above mentioned. He had in his hand a bow and arrows, and approaching our people he made some touches on his head, and then on his body, and afterwards did the same to our people. And this being done he raised both his hands to heaven. When the captain general knew all this, he sent to fetch him with his ship's boat, and brought him to one of the little islands which were in the port, where the ships were. In this island the captain had caused a house to be made for putting some of the ship's things in whilst he remained there. This giant was of a still better disposition than the others, and was a gracious and amiable person who liked to dance and leap. When he left, he caused the earth to sink in a palm depth at the place where his feet touched. He was a long time with us, and at the end we baptized him, and gave him the name of John. This giant pronounced the name of Jesus, the Pater Noster, Ava Maria, and his name as clearly as we did. But he had a terribly strong and loud voice. The captain gave him a shirt and a tunic of cloth, and seaman's breeches, a cap, a comb, some bells and other things, and sent him back to where he had come from. He went away very joyous and satisfied. The next day this giant returned and brought one of those large animals before mentioned, for which the captain gave him some other things, so that he should bring more. But afterwards he did not return, and it is to be presumed that the other giants killed him because he had come to us. Fifteen days later we saw four other giants who carried no arrows, for they had hid them in the bushes as two of them showed us, for we took them all four, and each of them was painted in a different way. The captain retained the two younger ones to take them to Spain on his return, but it was done by gentle and cunning means, for otherwise they would have done a hurt to some of our men. The manner in which he retained them was that he gave them many knives, forks, mirrors, bells, and glass, and they held all these things in their hands. Then the captain had some irons brought, such as are put on the feet of malefactors, these giants took pleasure in seeing the irons, but they did not know where to put them, and it grieved them that they could not take them with their hands, because they were hindered by the other things which they held in them. The other two giants were there and were desirous of helping the other two, 
but the captain would not let them, and made a sign to the two whom he wished to detain that they would put those irons on their feet, and then they would go away. At this they made a sign with their heads that they were content. Immediately the captain had the irons put on the feet of both of them, and when they saw that they were striking with the hammer on the bolt which crosses the said irons to rivet them, and to prevent them from being opened, these giants were afraid. But the captain made a sign not to doubt of anything. Nevertheless, when they saw the trick which had been played them, they began to be enraged, and to foam like bulls, crying out very loud Satibos, that is to say, the great devil, that he should help them. The hands of the other two giants were bound, but it was with great difficulty. Then the captain sent them back on shore, with nine of his men to conduct them, and to bring the wife of one of those who had remained in irons, because he regretted her greatly, as we saw by signs. But in going away, one of those two who were sent away untied his hands and escaped, running with such lightness that our men lost sight of him, and he went away where his companions were staying. But he found nobody of those that he had left with the women because they had gone to hunt. However, he went to look for them and found them and related to them all that had been done to them. The other giant, whose hands were tied, struggled as much as he could to unfasten himself, and to prevent his doing so, one of our men struck him and hurt him on the head, at which he got very angry. However, he led our people there where their wives were. Then, John Cavaggio, the pilot who was the chief conductor of these two giants, would not bring away the wife of one of the giants who had remained in irons on that evening, but was of opinion that they should sleep there because it was almost night. During this time, the one of the giants who had untied his hands came back from where he had been, with another giant, and they, seeing their companion wounded on the head, said nothing at that moment, but next morning they spoke in their language to the women and immediately all ran away together, and the smallest ran faster than the biggest, and they left all their chattels. Two of these giants, being rather a long way off, shot arrows at our men, and fighting thus, one of the giants pierced with an arrow the thigh of one of our men, of which he died immediately. Then, seeing that he was dead, all ran away. Our men had crossbows and guns, but they never could hit one of these giants, because they did not stand still in one place, but leaped hither and thither. After that our men buried the man who had been killed, and set fire to the place where those giants had left their chattels. Certainly these giants run faster than a horse, and they are very jealous of their wives. When these giants have a stomach ache, instead of taking medicine, they put down their throats an arrow about two feet long. Then they vomit a green bile mixed with blood. And the reason why they throw up this green matter is because they sometimes eat thistles. When they have headaches, they make a cut across the forehead and also on the arms and legs to draw blood from several parts of their bodies. One of the two we had taken and who was in our ship said that the blood did not choose to remain in the place and spot of the body where pain was felt. These people have their hair cut short and clipped in the manner of monks with a tonsure. They wear a cord of cotton round their head. To this they hang their arrows when they go a-hunting. When one of them dies, ten or twelve devils appear and dance all around the dead man. It seems that these are painted, and one of these enemies is taller than the others, and makes a greater noise, and more mirth than the others. That is whence these people have taken the custom of painting their faces and bodies, as has been said. The greatest of these devils is called in their language Satibos, and the others Chelule. Besides the above-mentioned things, this one who was in the ship with us told us by signs that he had seen devils with two horns on their heads, and long hair down to their feet and who threw out fire from their mouths and rumps. The captain named this kind of people Patagom, who have no houses but have huts made of the skins of the animals with which they clothe themselves, and go hither and thither with these huts of theirs, as the gypsies do. They live on raw meat and eat a certain sweet root, which they call kapak. These two giants that we had in the ship ate a large basketful of biscuit and rats without skinning them, and they drank half a bucket of water at each time. We remained in this port, which was called the Port of St. Julian, about five months, during which there happened to us many strange things, of which I will tell a part. One was that immediately that we entered into this port, the masters of the other four ships plotted treason against the Captain General, in order to put him to death. These were thus named John of Carthagene, Conductor of the Fleet, the Treasurer, Lois de Mendoza, the Conductor, Anthony Coca, and Gaspar de Casada. However, the treason was discovered, for which the treasurer was killed with stabs of a dagger, and then quartered. This Gaspar de Caseda had his head cut off, and afterwards was cut into quarters, and the conductor, having a few days later attempted another treason, was banished with a priest and was put in that country called Patagonia. 
The captain general would not put this conductor to death because the Emperor Charles had made him captain of one of the ships. One of our ships, named St. James, was lost in going to discover the coast. All the men, however, were saved by a miracle, for they were hardly wet at all. Two men of these who were saved came to us and told us all that had passed and happened, on which the captain at once sent some men with sacks full of biscuit for two months. So each day we found something of the ship of the other men who had escaped from the ship which was lost. And the place where these men were was twenty-five leagues from us, and the road bad and full of thorns, and it required four days to go there, and no water to drink was to be found on the road, but only ice, and of that little. In this port of St. Julian there were a great quantity of long capers, called Messiglione. These had pearls in the midst. In this place they found incense, and ostriches, foxes, sparrows, and rabbits, a good deal smaller than ours. We set up at the top of the highest mountain which was there a very large cross, as a sign that this country belonged to the King of Spain, and we gave to this mountain the name of Mount of Christ. Departing thence we found in fifty-one degrees less one-third, fifty degrees forty minutes south, in the Antarctic, a river of fresh water, which was near causing us to be lost, from the great winds which it sent out. But God of his favor aided us. We were about two months in this river, as it supplied fresh water and a kind of fish, an L long, and very scaly, which is good to eat. Before going away, the captain chose that all should confess and receive the body of our Lord like good Christians. Chapter After going and taking the course to the 52nd degree of the said Antarctic sky, on the day of the 11,000 virgins, October 21st, we found, by a miracle, a strait which we called the Cape of the 11,000 virgins. This strait is a hundred and ten leagues long, which are four hundred and forty miles, and almost as wide as less than half a league, and it issues in another sea which is called the Peaceful Sea. It is surrounded by very great and high mountains covered with snow. In this place it was not possible to anchor with the anchors, because no bottom was found, on which account they were forced to put the moorings of twenty-five or thirty fathoms length on shore. This strait was a round place surrounded by mountains, as I have said and the greater number of the sailors thought that there was no place by which to go out thence to enter into the peaceful sea, i.e. the Pacific Sea. But the captain general said that there was another strait for going out, and said that he knew it well because he had seen it by a marine chart of the king of Portugal, which map had been made by a great pilot and mariner called Martin of Bohemia, or Martin Beheim. The captain sent on before two of his ships, one named St. Anthony and the other the Conception, to seek for and discover the outlet of this strait, which was called the Cape de la Baia, and we with the other two ships, that is to say the flagship named Trinitat, and the other the Victory, remained waiting for them within the bay, where in the night we had a great storm which lasted till the next day at midday, and during which we were forced to weigh the anchors and let the ships go hither and thither about the bay. The other two ships met with such a headwind that they could not weather a cape which the bay made almost at its extremity. Wishing to come to us, they were near being driven to beach the ships. But on approaching the extremity of the bay, and whilst expecting to be lost, they saw a small mouth which did not resemble a mouth but a corner, and like people giving up hope, they threw themselves into it, so that by force they discovered the strait. Seeing that it was not a corner but a strait of land, they went further on and found a bay. Then going still further, they found another strait and another bay larger than the first two, at which, being very joyous, they suddenly returned backwards to tell it to the captain general. Amongst us we thought that they had perished, first because of the great storm, next because two days had passed that we had not seen them. And being thus in doubt, we saw the two ships under all sail, with ensigns spread, come towards us. These, when near us, suddenly discharged much artillery, at which we, very joyous, saluted them with artillery and shouts. Afterwards, altogether thanking God and the Virgin Mary, we went to seek further on. After having entered inside this strait, we found that there were two mouths, of which one trended to the Sirocco, southeast, and the other to the Garbon, southwest. On that account, the captain again sent the two ships, St. Anthony and Conception, to see if the mouth which was toward Sirocco had an outlet beyond into the said peaceful sea. One of these two ships named St. Anthony would not wait for the other ship, because those who were inside wished to return to Spain. This they did, and the principal reason was on account of the pilot of the said ship being previously discontented with the said Captain General, because that before this armament was made, 
This pilot had gone to the emperor to talk about having some ships to discover countries, but on account of the arrival of the captain general, the emperor did not give them to this pilot, on account of which he agreed with some Spaniards, and the following night they took prisoner the captain of their ship, who was a brother of the captain general, and who was named Elbar de Mesquite. They wounded him and put him in irons. So they carried him off to Spain. And in this ship, which went away and returned, was one of the two above-mentioned giants whom we had taken. And when he felt the heat, he died. The other ship, named the Conception, not being able to follow that one, was always waiting for it and fluttered hither and thither. But it lost its time, for the other took the road by night for returning. When this happened, at night the ship of the captain and the other ship went together to discover the other mouth to Garbin, southwest where, on always holding on our course, we found the same strait. But at the end we arrived at a river which we named the River of Sardines, because we found a great quantity of them. So we remained there four days to wait for the other two ships. A short time after we sent a boat well supplied with men and provisions to discover the cape of the other sea. These remained three days in going and coming. They told us that they had found the cape and the sea great and wide. At the joy which the captain general had at this he began to cry, and he gave the name of Cape of Desire to this cape, as a thing which had been much desired for a long time. Having done that, we turned back to find the two ships which were at the other side, but we only found the Conception, of which ship we asked what had become of her companion. To this the captain of the said ship, named John Serrano, who was pilot of the first ship which was lost as has been related, replied that he knew nothing of her, and that he had never seen her since she entered the mouth. However, we sought for her through all the strait as far as the said mouth, by which she had taken her course to return. Besides that, the captain general sent back the ship named the Victory as far as the entrance of the strait to see if the ship was there, and he told the people of the ship that if they did not find the ship they were looking for, they were to place an ensign on the summit of a small hill with a letter inside a pot placed in the ground near the ensign, so that if the ship should return by chance, it might see that ensign, and also find a letter which would give information of the course which the captain was holding. This manner of acting had been ordained by the captain from the commencement, in order to effect the junction of any ship which might be separated from the others. So the people of the said ship did what the captain had commanded them, and more, for they set two ensigns with letters. One of the ensigns was placed on a small hill at the first bay, the other on an islet in the third bay, where there were many sea wolves and large birds. The captain general waited for them with the other ship near the river named Isles, and he caused a cross to be set upon a small island in front of that river, which was between high mountains covered with snow. This river comes and falls into the sea near the other river of the Sardines. If we had not found this strait, the captain general had made up his mind to go as far as 75 degrees towards the Antarctic Pole, where at that height in the summertime there is no night or very little. In a similar manner, in the winter there is no daylight or very little. And so that every one may believe this, when we were in this strait, the night lasted only three hours, and this was in the month of October. The land of this strait on the left-hand side looked towards the Sirocco wind, which is the wind collateral to the Levant and south. We called this strait Pathagonico. In it we found at every half league a good port and place for anchoring, good waters, wood olive cedar, and fish like sardines, misiglioni, and a very sweet herb named apio, celery. There is also some of the same kind which is bitter. This herb grows near the springs, and from not finding anything else we ate of it for several days. I think that there is not in the world a more beautiful country or better strait than this one. In this ocean sea one sees a very amusing chase of fish, which are of three sorts, of an L or more in length, and they call these fish dorads, albacores, and bonitos. These follow and pursue another sort of fish which flies, which they call colandrini which are a foot long or more, and are very good to eat. When these three sorts of fish find in the water any of these flying fish, immediately they make them come out of the water, and they fly more than a crossbow shot, as long as their wings are wet. And whilst these fishes fly, the other three run after them under the water, seeing the shadow of those that fly. And the moment they fall into the water, they are seized upon and eaten by the others, which pursue them, which is a thing marvelous and agreeable to see. Now that shows the vocabulary of the giants of Patagonia, and it shows the Milan edition, it shows the French, and then shows the Patagonian. So it says, Vocable des géants Patagonian. I'll just include it. You guys can read it.
The Italian words mixed up in the French manuscript show that this manuscript was written by Pigafetta and not translated from his Italian. None of these words resemble those given by the Jesuit, Faulkner, from the language of the Molouche tribe. All these words are pronounced in the throat because they pronounce them thus. These words were given me by that giant whom we had in the ship, because he asked me for capach, that is to say bread, since they thus name that root which they use for bread, and oli, that is to say water. When he saw me write these names after him and ask for others, he understood what I was doing, with my pen in my hand. Another time I made a cross and kissed it and showing it to him, but suddenly he exclaimed, Satibos! and made signs to me that if I again made the cross it would enter into my stomach and make me die. When this giant was unwell, he asked for the cross, and embraced and kissed it much, and he wished to become a Christian before his death, and we named him Paul. When these people wish to light a fire, they take a pointed stick and rub it with another until they make a fire in the pith of a tree, which is placed between these sticks. In the Milan edition, here begins Book 2. Wednesday, the 28th of November, 1520, we came forth out of the said strait, and entered into the Pacific Sea where we remained three months and twenty days without taking in provisions or other refreshments, and we only ate old biscuit reduced to powder and full of grubs, and stinking from the dirt which the rats had made on it when eating the good biscuit, and we drank water that was yellow and stinking. We also ate the ox hides which were under the main yard, so that the yard should not break the rigging. They were very hard on account of the sun, rain, and wind, and we left them for four or five days in the sea, and then we put them a little on the embers, and so ate them, also the sawdust of wood, and rats which cost half a crown each. Moreover, enough of them were not to be got. Besides the above-named evils, this misfortune which I will mention was the worst. It was that the upper and lower gums of most of our men grew so much that they could not eat, and in this way so many suffered that nineteen died, and the other giant, an Indian from the country of Verzen, Besides those who died, twenty-five or thirty fell ill of diverse sicknesses, both in the arms and legs and other places, in such manner that very few remained healthy. However, thanks be to the Lord, I had no sickness. During those three months and twenty days we went in an open sea, while we ran fully four thousand leagues in the Pacific Sea. This was well named Pacific, for during the same time we met with no storm, and saw no land except two small uninhabited islands, in which we found only birds and trees. We named them the Unfortunate Islands, they are two hundred leagues apart from one another, and there is no place to anchor as there is no bottom. There we saw many sharks which are a kind of large fish which they call Tiburoni. The first isle is in fifteen degrees of austral latitude, and the other island is in nine degrees. With the said wind we ran each day fifty or sixty leagues or more, now with the wind astern, sometimes on a wind or otherwise. And if our Lord and his mother had not aided us in giving us good weather to refresh ourselves with provisions and other things, we should all have died of hunger in this very vast sea, and I think that never man will undertake to perform such a voyage. So you can see they're heartily Catholic. They believe that the Lord Mother, Mother Mary, looks out for them. They have this thing where they put Mother Mary above Jesus. You know, they say, what is it, uh, Mary, Mother of God. It's, anyway, they actually believe she's above him, which is blasphemy. Carrying on. When we had gone out of this strait, if we had always navigated to the west, we should have gone without finding any land except the Cape of the Eleven Thousand Virgins, which is the eastern head of the strait in the Ocean Sea, with the Cape of Desire at the west in the Pacific Sea. These two capes are exactly in 52 degrees of latitude of the Antarctic Pole. The Antarctic Pole is not so covered with stars as the Arctic, for there are to be seen there many small stars congregated together, which are like to two clouds a little separated from one another, and a little dimmed, in the midst of which are two stars, not very large nor very brilliant, and they move but little. These two stars are the Antarctic Pole. Our compass needle still pointed a little to its Arctic Pole, nevertheless it had not as much power as on its own side and region. Yet when we were in the open sea, the captain general asked of all the pilots, while still going under sail, in what direction they were navigating and pointing the charts. They all replied by the course he had given, punctually pricked in. Then he answered that they were pointing falsely, which was so, and that it was fitting to arrange the needle of navigation, because it did not receive so much force as in its own quarter. When we were in the middle of this open sea, we saw a cross of five stars, very bright, straight, in the west, 
and they are straight one with another. During this time of two months and twelve days, we navigated between west and northwest, Maestro, and a quarter west of northwest, and also northwest, until we came to the equinoctial line, which was, at a point, 122 degrees distant from the line of repartition. This line of delimitation is 30 degrees distant from the meridian, and the meridian is 3 degrees distant from the Cape Verde towards the east. In going by this course, we pass near two very rich islands. One is in 20 degrees latitude in the Antarctic Pole, and is called Shipangu. The other, in 15 degrees of the same pole, is named Samrpradit. After we had passed the equinoctial line, we navigated between west and northwest and a quarter west by northwest. Afterwards, we made 200 leagues to westwards, then changed the course to a quarter of southwest, until in 13 degrees north latitude, in order to approach the land of Cape Gatikara, which cape, under correction of those who have made cosmography, for they have never seen it, is not placed where they think, but is towards the north, in 12 degrees or thereabouts. After having navigated 60 leagues by the said course, in 12 degrees latitude and 146 of longitude, on Wednesday the 6th of March, we discovered a small island in the northwest direction, and two others lying to the southwest. One of these islands was larger and higher than the other two. The Captain General wished to touch at the largest of these three islands to get refreshments of provisions, but it was not possible because the people of these islands entered into the ships and robbed us in such a way that it was impossible to preserve oneself from them. Whilst we were striking and lowering the sails to go ashore, they stole away with much address and diligence the small boat called the skiff, which was made fast to the poop of the captain's ship, at which he was much irritated and went on shore with forty armed men, burned forty or fifty houses with several small boats, and killed seven men of the island. They recovered their skiff. After this we set sail suddenly, following the same course. Before we went ashore, some of our sick men begged us that if we killed man or woman, that we should bring them their entrails, as they would see themselves suddenly cured. It must be known that when we wounded any kind of this people with our arrows, which entered inside their bodies, they looked at the arrow, and then drew it forth with much astonishment, and immediately afterwards they died. Immediately after we sailed from that island, following our course, and those people seeing that we were going away, followed us for a league, with a hundred small boats or more, and they approached our ships, showing to us fish, and feigning to give it to us. But they threw stones at us, and then ran away, and in their flight they passed with their little boats between the boat which is towed at the poop, and the ship going under full sail. But they did this so quickly and with such skill that it was a wonder, and we saw some of these women who cried out and tore their hair, and I believe that it was for the love of those whom we had killed. Chapter 5 these people live in liberty and according to their will, for they have no lord or superior. They go quite naked, and some of them wear beards, and have their hair down to their waist. They wear small hats after the fashion of the Albanians. These hats are made of palm leaves. The people are as tall as us and well made. They adore nothing, and when they are born they are white. Later they become brown and have their teeth black and red. The women also go naked except that they cover their nature with a thin bark, pliable like paper which grows between the tree and the bark of the palm. They are beautiful and delicate and whiter than the men, and have their hair loose and flowing, very black and long, down to the earth. They do not go to work in the fields nor stir from their houses, making cloth and baskets of palm leaves. Their provisions are certain fruits named kochi, batate. There are birds, figs, a palm long, sweet canes, and flying fish. The women anoint their bodies and their hair with oil of cocoa and ganglioni, or sesame. Their houses are constructed of wood covered with planks with fig leaves, which are two ells in length. They have only one floor. Their rooms and beds are furnished with mats which we call matting, which are made of palm leaves and are very beautiful, and they lie down on palm straw which is soft and fine. These people have no arms but use sticks which have a fish bone at the end. They are poor but ingenious and great thieves, and for the sake of that we call these three islands the Ladrone Islands. The pastime of the men and the women of this place, and their diversion, is to go with their little boats to catch those fish which fly, with hooks made of fish bones. The pattern of their small boats is painted hereafter. They are like the fusiliers, but narrower, some of them black and white, and others red. On the opposite side to the sail they have a large piece of wood, pointed above with poles across, which are in the water, in order to go more securely under sail. 
Their sails are of palm leaves sewed together and of the shape of a lateen sail, fore and aft. They have certain shovels like hearth shovels, and there is no difference between the poop and the prow in these boats, and they are like dolphins bounding from wave to wave. These thieves thought, according to the signs they made, that there were no other men in the world besides them. Saturday, the 16th of March, 1521, we arrived at daybreak in sight of a high island, 300 leagues distant from the before-mentioned Thieves' Island. This isle is named Zamal. The next day the Captain General wished to land at another uninhabited island near the first, to be in greater security and to take water, also to repose there a few days. He set up there two tents on shore for the sick, and had a sow killed for them. Monday, the 18th of March, after dinner, we saw a boat come towards us with nine men in it, upon which the Captain General ordered that no one should move or speak without his permission. When these people had come into this island towards us, immediately the principal one amongst them went towards the Captain General with demonstrations of being very joyous at our arrival. Five of the most showy of them remained with us. The others who remained with the boat went to call some men who were fishing, and afterwards all of them came together. The captain, seeing that these people were reasonable, ordered food and drink to be given them, and he gave them some red caps, looking glasses, combs, bells, ivory, and other things. When these people saw the politeness of the captain, they presented some fish and a vessel of palm wine, which they call in their language Eureka, figs more than a foot long, and others smaller and of a better savor, and two cochos. At that time they had nothing to give him and they made signs to us with their hands that in four days they would bring us yumai, which is rice, cocos, and many other victuals. They're moving toward uh, Hawaii and the warmer islands. To explain the kind of fruits above named, it must be known that the one which they called kochi is the fruit which the palm trees bear. And as we have bread, wine, oil, and vinegar proceeding from different kinds, so these people have those things proceeding from these palm trees only. It must be said that wine proceeds from the said palm trees in the following manner. They make a hole at the summit of the tree as far as its heart, which is named palmito, from which a liquor comes out and drops down the tree, like white must, which is sweet but with somewhat of bitter. They have canes as thick as the leg, in which they draw off this liquor, and they fasten them to the tree from the evening till next morning, and from the morning to the evening, because this liquor comes little by little. This palm produces a fruit named cocho, which is as large as the head or thereabouts. Its first husk is green and two fingers in thickness. In it they find certain threads with which they make the cords for fastening their boats. Under this husk there is another very hard and thicker than that of a walnut. They burn this second rind and make with it a powder which is useful to them. Under this rind there is a white marrow of a finger's thickness, which they eat fresh with meat and fish, as we do bread and it has the taste of an almond, and if anyone dried it, he might make bread from it. From the middle of this marrow there comes out a clear sweet water and very cordial, which, when it has rested a little and settled, congeals and becomes like an apple. When they wish to make oil, they take this fruit, the cocoa, and let it get rotten, and they corrupt this marrow in the water, then they boil it, and it becomes oil in the manner of butter. When they want to make vinegar, they let the water in the coconut get bad, and they put it in the sun when it turns to vinegar like white wine. From this fruit, milk also can be made, as we experienced, for we scraped this marrow and then put it with its water and passed it through a cloth, and thus it was milk like that of goats. This kind of palm tree is like the date palm but not so rugged. Two of these trees can maintain a family of ten persons, but they do not dry wine as above mentioned, always from one tree, but draw from one for eight days and from the other as long for if they did not otherwise, the trees would dry up. In this manner they last a hundred years. These people became very familiar and friendly with us, and explained many things to us in their language, and told us the names of some islands which we saw with our eyes before us. The island where they dwelt is called Zuluan, and it is not large. As they were sufficiently agreeable and conversable, we had great pleasure with them. The captain, seeing that they were of this good condition, to do them greater honor, conducted them to the ship, and showed them all his goods, that is to say, cloves, cinnamon, pepper, ginger, nutmeg, mace, gold, and all that was in the ship. He also had some shots fired with his artillery, at which they were so much afraid that they wished to jump from the ship into the sea. They made signs that the things which the captain had shown them grew there where we were going. 
When they wished to leave us, they took leave of the captain and of us with very good manners and gracefulness, promising us to come back to see us. The island we were at was named Himunu. Nevertheless, because we found there two springs of very fresh water, we named it the watering place of good signs, and because we found here the first signs of gold. There is much white coral to be found here, and large trees which bear fruit smaller than an almond, and which are like pines. There were also many palm trees, both good and bad. In this place there were many circumjacent lands, on which account we named the Archipelago of St. Lazarus, because we stayed there on the day and feast of St. Lazarus. This region and archipelago is in 10 degrees north latitude, and 161 degrees longitude from the line of demarcation. Pidgefetta's account of Magellan's voyage.